He calls me Danny. Nope, not enough. <laughs> All right, well, good morning, everyone, and uh, we'll go ahead and dive into our study in Daniel today, and uh, before we start, we'll open up in a word of prayer. Father... <clears throat> I pray that your name would be glorified today in everything that we say and do. I pray that you would help us to be attentive to your word, to your Holy Spirit speaking to us. I pray, Father, that you would guide uh, the words that I say as I teach and as I encourage others to share. Father, that we together as a body of Christ would grow closer to you. Um, be blessing all of the Sunday school classes this morning and be with each teacher. Bless and multiply their efforts and preparation and continue to bring the word into the hearts and lives of all those who are here this morning. Just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay. So this morning, I am um, glad to see you all here and, and uh, we are in our I don't know what, our sixth week of studying the book of Daniel, and we're in chapter four. We're kind of falling further and further behind, but we are, I know for a fact, going to get through chapter four today, because I think we will. Um, <clears throat> but I'd like to start out with a little bit of review, just to kind of recap where we've been, and then we'll dive right into it. Um, so a couple of questions, and I'm going to pick on Owen first. Um, Owen, what book are we studying? Do you remember? Very good. See, you thought I was going to ask you a hard question. You had it nailed it right there. Thank you. And so we're studying in the book of Daniel. I asked Steve Dobler that the same question this morning. He looked at me like, you mean you don't know? And so, so we are studying the book of Daniel, and we are going in chapter 4 this morning, starting in chapter 4. But there's a couple of things that I want to pull out for you to help you um, uh, keep it all into context. So who is the key character in this book other than Daniel right now so far? Who's the key character? Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar is kind of the key character. And last week, one of the things that we draw, drew out of chapter 4 was the fact that he actually is the author, the writer in this book. So he's actually one who's, who's dictating and having things written down here. And he's telling the story of his conversion, really. His start from a secular standpoint, a pagan standpoint, and his progression throughout there. And there's a wonderful series of lessons for us built all around what drew, drew him or what brought him to that point. So... <clears throat> Beginning with chapter 4, I've, uh, well, I actually have one other question. Why was Daniel brought into captivity? I ask this question every, t every week. And you forget. And I forget. Why was Daniel brought into captivity? He didn't keep the law. Yeah, the Israelites had left the law. They had left their prom the promises of God, and they were rebel living in rebellion, right? Okay, so that was one reason why Daniel was caught up in this and brought in. Why else? As part of God's plan, his sovereign plan, and his sovereign plan extends from just up to the time that they were taken into captivity, right? Or did it go beyond that? Yeah, it's ongoing, it's bigger. What would you say, Alice? Okay. All right. So it's this ongoing plan, and it was a piece of that plan. And part of the book of Daniel, the reason Daniel was taken into captivity is to communicate to Nebuchadnezzar over and over again. It's, you had this dream, I was brought up here, so you could know, Nebuchadnezzar, so you could know, so you could understand. So it's almost like the book of Daniel, at least the first four chapters, is like God is like pursuing Nebuchadnezzar. It's really weird that way. Because he's not really your typical candidate to be caused to come to God. But it sure appears that all of these events 
are set up, but it's also a story about mankind and how God has been pursuing mankind to bring us to himself. And so in the whole fullness of the book of Daniel, we are going to see this prophetic timeline, this whole tie to God's overall plan for us as a nation. Pardon? Uh, well, I guess, Bill, that's a good question. What is the typical type that God would call? I guess what I'm thinking of is typically we look, read through the scriptures and it's God giving a message to his people to get them on board. And in this case, he's being evangelistic a little bit to Nebuchadnezzar, it feels like to me, anyways, as I read it. So we're going to open up. Um, so Daniel brought in this passage, this, this writing that Nebuchadnezzar made. He made a proclamation, and uh, we're going to start right in chapter 4, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the peoples, nations, and men of every language who live in all the world, it is my, oh, may you prosper greatly. So it's a blessing, a, a, um, a phrase that often uh, is found in uh, the communications that the um, the Babylonians gave, and also the Persians later on. And, and it's just one of those things to say, hey, I w wish you all the best. And then, it is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. So Nebuchadnezzar's telling the story here. He's drawing out for us um, uh, his experience. And so from that point on, moving forward, it's going to be story time. Nebuchadnezzar's going to be telling the story about his experience. So as we read through that, we want to make sure that we think back to before the whole thing happened to him. And that's the paradigm that Nebuchadnezzar is writing about it. And what kind of a guy was Nebuchadnezzar? Anybody remember? Was he really a nice, joyful guy? He was always wishing the best for everybody, and he was kind to people, right? He thought about others' needs. He was one of those um, people that would be willing to send a COVID-19 check to everybody, even whether they needed it or not, you know, just because he really cared about people, right? That was Nebuchadnezzar. He was prideful and very evil. Yeah, anything to add to that? Ruthless. Ruthless. Oh, yeah. He was very ruthless. Remember what he said to the guys who said, oh, if you can't tell me the dream that I dreamt, <laughs> I'm going to, if you can't re tell me the dream that I had and interpret it for me, I'm going to kill you and turn your, your house into a dung heap. That's really kind and generous, generous and sensitive, isn't it? But no, King Nebuchadnezzar was a ruthless, prideful, arrogant ruler. And so we are going to see, as he goes into this story, how that, his whole paradigm changes. His whole perspective changes. Even in verse 3, it looks right there. He says, how great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. Remember he wanted to make the statue so that he could be worshipped? I mean, the whole thing, Nebuchadnezzar, all about him. I used a term. Anybody remember what it was called? Starts with an N. Narcissism. Yeah, narcissist. He was all about himself. He was the classic narcissist. If you look up in a psychology book, they probably have narcissist. Definition, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, I mean, he was really that kind of an individual. So... We see him having at least verbally expressing a change in his perspective. It's not all about him anymore. So, let's continue on in verse, verse 4. And um, how many, uh, we talked about this before. How many of you have dreams that keep you up at night sometimes or wake you up and you're kind of worried and concerned about them? I know I shared before, I had a dream about the house burning down and what, did, what would we do and how do we get out and how, what would we do for the kids and everything else. Of course, the kids are all married and off, but this was a while ago. And anyways, uh, it's something I was worried about, concerned about. And uh, I'm going to hop over the rabbit hole that says, does God talk to us in dreams today? I'm not going to go there right now. We can come back to that at some point in time if we want to, but... Um, 
let's, let's go on here. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in my bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. <clears throat> so, what's the difference between the earlier dream experience that Nebuchadnezzar had and this one? Yeah, yeah, before he was being very unreasonable. Here he's, he's a little bit more reasonable. He's at least telling them what the dream is. He remembers it, what it is. Some people think that he was totally forgetful, but he knew that he had a dream in the first one. Some people think he was just laying a trap for the uh, magicians and everybody else. But the point here is, this time, he's got a little bit of, well, he's concerned about it, and he wants that answer, and so he's telling them the dream. And uh, so what else do we find here about the magicians and the sorcerers and... <laughs> yeah, they are still incompetent. And yet he, still called them first. he still called them first, which is protocol, right? Yep. He, br he brought them in and asked them, here's a question I have of you. Do you think that they knew what the dream was about? And if they did, why wouldn't they share it with Nebuchadnezzar? Okay, in this case, he actually tells them the dream, and he's asking for an interpretation, but what if they know what the dream is about? Their whole craft is guesswork anyway, so when, you know, when you don't have that solid foundation of knowing from the God of heaven of what the dream actually means, anything you say could be used against you. <laughs> could be used against you. Yeah, that's a very good point, Darren. So really, they were probably, I mean, we can look at it from our perspective today, and we can look at the astrologers and all of these folks and say, yeah, they got nothing, right? It's negative, he's not going to believe with anything. Yeah, well, or if it's negative, what's somebody like Nebuchadnezzar going to do to somebody who gives them bad news? Get rid of them. Yeah, get rid of them. I don't want to hear that from you. Unless it's good about me, I don't want to hear it. No, at verse 8, he is pre-understanding of God's sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Yep, you're absolutely right, Anne. So as we look at these astrologers and everybody else, I kind of think they might have an inkling, but they're not willing to go out on a limb and say, yeah, this is you guy, and you need to change your, your attitude. <laughs> think about that. This guy is not the kind of guy you want to give bad news to. He's not going to want to listen to that. So I ask you this. Are there people like that in your life? Or are you like that? That nobody wants to confront you about things that you aren't doing, that you should be doing, or are off base on? <laughs> yeah. Do you want some feedback? Have you ever heard that at work? Uh, yeah. That's like, no, I don't want any feedback. So it's the whole idea here is... How receptive would Nebuchadnezzar be to that kind of a feedback? I, I don't know. I, I, it doesn't really matter, but it is kind of interesting to think. Because I wonder, now this has been 20, 25 years. And I want you to pay attention to how Nebuchadnezzar addresses Daniel. I want you to pay attention to how Nebuchadnezzar addresses Daniel. So let's continue reading on here. It says, Daniel came into my presence, so he said, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. He is called Belshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I said, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, 
Let's stop there for a moment. What happened way back in chapter 2? Daniel got what? Promoted. To? Yeah, he got promoted to chief of the magicians. Now scroll this forward. This is probably 25 years later. And how does he address Daniel? Chief of the magicians. He's still in charge of them. Good question. Good question. It might be protocol. It might be, we start with the, all these guys, and if they can't, then we bring in the top dog, right? I, I got something to say. Yeah. What do you think uh, Daniel's influence was on these other You're getting right at what I was thinking about, Ron. Yeah, what, what do you think Daniel's influence was on these other magicians and astrologers and everybody? He was their boss. Could be. From what we read in scripture, absolutely spot on, and only Daniel and his three friends displayed faith in God up to this point. The magicians and astrologers and all those people, they probably recognized Daniel's special abilities. Because we can see, huh? But I don't know. There's nothing in here that tells me, but I still kind of guess and say, gosh, he's had to have had some influence being in a position of authority and responsibility for 25 years. He's got to have had something to say to these people along the way. Yes, they did. Because when Nebuchadnezzar wrote this down, it is not just, as a matter of fact, it's not in Hebrew, it's in Aramaic. It again is written, or Chaldean, is written to the Chaldeans. So, and you think about it, in this passage he's calling out, again, before he's been really realized what is going on, he calls Belshazzar by the name of my God. He is still in that, that perspective of not knowing and trusting in the true God at this point in time. So Nebuchadnezzar's not there, but he does recognize Daniel's special abilities here. He's seen it probably over and over again. We only have four chapters of it um, at this point in time, but he's probably got to know that. Let's continue on. Is it worth thinking about? So here is my dream. Oh, no. I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. Interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in my bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the beasts of the field found shelter, and the birds of the air lived in the branches. From it, every creature was fed. Okay, so starting there, a little interesting historical, archaeological type of find here is that um, in the Babylonian culture, we have a lot of um, documentation or letters or actually prayers and that sort of thing that Nebuchadnezzar wrote. We have a lot of history, non-biblical history, artifacts that they found that are attributed to Nebuchadnezzar. So you have all of this, this extra biblical, biblical information. And it's very interesting that Nebuchadnezzar really, really liked trees. As a matter of fact, he was really struck by going to um, the cedars of Lebanon and noticing the great huge cedars that they had there and how much he appreciated that. As a matter of fact, one of the seven wonders of the world was what? Anybody remember? The yeah, the hanging gardens that Nebuchadnezzar actually built for his wife who loved trees and all this. And so Nebuchadnezzar was infatuated, actually obsessed with trees. We could see this from his extra biblical extra, that's hard to say, the stuff outside of the Bible that was written and found, 
So you think about this dream, and there's even a prayer in there talking about how my tree is so high, and he's praying it to Marduk, his, his god. My tree is so high, and the birds of the field come to it. It's this exact passage, but it's written as a prayer about thinking that he's, he's this great king, how great and how, how awesome Nebuchadnezzar is. And so I think it's just so fitting that God would use what is in his mind and what he's obsessed with to bring about a, real, a realization of who he really was in God's sight. Yep. Yeah, yeah. God is in the process of using Nebuchadnezzar in a bunch of different ways. A bunch of different ways. God uses not just the believers, but he uses all unbelievers and blesses them too. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that is and that is attributed to God's sovereignty. So he chooses to use whoever he wants. And I'm jump, jumping to the end of the story, but it's really something that we're getting reinforced all the way along. God chooses whoever he wants to be in authority. And it's not really us. And he uses us for good. Yep. All a part of his ultimate plan, right? Mm -hmm. Right? His good from his perspective. Not necessarily always good from our own individual perspective. <laughs> That's probably true, and he probably doesn't slap us around. Okay, so here he goes. So then it goes on with the dream. So the, the things, the components of the dream, he's got the tree, the food, the animals. He's got all of these things that he's talking about. And uh, then here comes the, the harder part of the dream to swallow. In the vision, while I was lying in bed, I looked, and there before me was a messenger a holy one, coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree, trim off its branches, strip off its leaves, scatter its fruit, let the animals flee from under it, and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its root, bound with iron and bronze, remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with dew. Oh, let me, before we go into that. Okay, so we got all these, these components what is, seems a little bit odd here about cutting down this tree? What jumps out at you that's a little bit kind of inconsistent? Yeah. Yeah, how many of you ever used a stump grinder? I know, John Anderson, you have. Okay. So you use a stump grinder, you get rid of the stump, you dig out the roots. Ron, I bet you've turned a few roots over in your day. Yep, by, with your bare hand, right? Just. No. Oh. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. I'll, I'll tell you quickly how all I did it. I backed my skitter up to the tree and hooked it up, stand up on the arch, and hooked the chain up as high as I could. Okay. And then I go full tilt, put that tree forward, and that tree, tree tip over every time. Is that right? I'm surprised that it didn't come. Okay, well, you know, Nebuchadnezzar didn't have a skid steer, though. So, um, and in his dream, the stump was left. Now, if you know anything about birch trees, you cut down a birch tree, what, and, and you leave the stump, what happens? Yeah, yeah, you get a whole bunch of new ones. My, my step-grandmother, she's from um, Arkansas, she called him Clump Birch. <laughs> I can't say it with her accent, but it's so cute that she would talk about these Clump Birch that would grow up out of the stumps and, and, uh, and everything else. But God's got a plan for the stump and the roots. And that's, uh, I think, a hope here and a part of the dream and the interpretation. So let's go on a little bit further. <clears throat> and notice how the phraseology changes here. He's talking about the tree. 
And then the, the way that this was all um, laid out, that one comes from heaven and, and talks about it, and then it continues and it changes the phraseology here. It says, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let him, his mind, be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. So what's the change here in tone? What is, how did it change? What word is emphasized? Him. It's personalized. It's talking about a person at this point in time. The transition is from this inanimate object of a tree to him. And so as Daniel goes to interpret it, I'm sure that's a key in how, what he was looking for. And the decision is announced by messengers. The Holy One declares the verdict so that the living may know. If you've got a Bible and you want to underline this, would be a good verse to underline. That the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdom of, kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of men. Now, why is that kind of weird? He talks about God's sovereignty and everything else, but he gives it to who? The lowliest of men. Why is that surprising? Yeah, you, you would think that power and fame should be to somebody who's of high standing, right? But Nebuchadnezzar... Anybody know, and Wayne, you probably do know this, and, and some of the others here, who was Nebuchadnezzar's father? Anybody know? His name was, I think, Neoplasmer, or something like that. Anyways, this guy, Neoplasmer, he did not in, come, uh, be born as a king. He grew up... He started as a very lowly individual, and you can see his writings again in the archaeology to find that he actually came from a very humble beginning, and he got to a point of, of being the king. Now, he wasn't a good guy. He was the one who sent Nebuchadnezzar to go attack Jerusalem to wipe him out. But we can see that there's a relationship here that God chooses who's going to be in authority. Nebuchadnezzar ended up just getting it because his dad died and his dad was king. His dad actually worked at it to get to that kingship. So just, just background information how Nebuchadnezzar's mind, all of these things tied in in the background and how he was experiencing this dream and how it related to him. So The decision is announced by messengers. The Holy One declares the verdict. So this does not sound good for whoever this is about. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me. But you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. And again, he's speaking before his realization of all of this. So... What do you think went through Daniel's mind as he thought about this whole interpretation? What do you think? God's not going to let me rest on my laurels. Or... <laughs> yep. You know, as we open it up, and, and he said, God's not going to let me rest on my laurels. He's not going to just... Let me coast through on this. Um, Daniel's put on the spot here because he's got to bring bad news to the king, and the king's not going to like it. I think life in Daniel is about that time I've been doing some serious praying. <laughs> I would think so. I bet Daniel is kind of thinking, uh, maybe I'd like to get with my three friends and pray first before I give you this answer. Um, but... to get the people to 
I would fully agree with you at this point in time he's just reacting to the situation that he's in and and uh, so Dick is saying that he doesn't really believe that Nebuchadnezzar ever ever fully converted or b became a believer and that's totally fine but um, and and I don't have a problem with that perspective but I want you to look right now we're gonna we're gonna step right into a simple question here why is he having this dream why is Nebuchadnezzar having this dream? Well, you know, God gives people, men, the right, the wrong or right to do what they want. But well, along with that, and what people don't want to admit, is he's also controlling the circumstances that come to you. Right. Okay, so, so God gives us a free choice, but he controls the circumstances or has his hand in the circumstances or at least knows all of the circumstances, right? And he knows the results. And he knows the results. So you still haven't answered my question. Why is he having this dream? He wants to draw him to himself. He wants to draw him to himself. He wants Nebuchadnezzar to be drawn to God or us to be drawn to God, right? Again, we have to think about the whole big picture, the long area of this whole thing. It's not just about one small little event in history. God shares and writes the scriptures for our benefit now in the long term. So, yeah. Yes, yes. He is telling him God is number one. And what is specifically God pointing out to Nebuchadnezzar that he needs to change his perspective on? Well, he's going to lay all of his power down, no, or no chance, no choice, right? Yeah, to repent of his sins. And what is the biggest, most glaring sin that Nebuchadnezzar has? So if you take a look at the, uh, hold, hold on, hold on. Pride? What were you going to say? Pride. Pride. Okay. So if you look at, at Pharaoh, he had all of those things come to him, but he never changed them. Yeah, so pride is really a hard thing for us to get over. So I'm gonna, we're going to shift gears just a tiny bit. And I, I don't like to do this necessarily when I'm studying a book to jump elsewhere. But I think it's really important that we grab a hold of the main message of this passage, which is Nebuchadnezzar... You have pride. And how does God view pride? So I have, I want you, I'm going to give you, yep, I have time. I'm going to give you a minute to talk with the people next to you. I want your definition of what pride is. So talk to the people you're sitting next to or across from or whatever. I want a definition of what pride is. That goes for you too as well. You know, don't, don't influence them. You, you be on your own. Those two can work on their own. Okay. I want you to come up with a definition of what pride is. I'm going to ask you.
Time's up. Give you guys an inch and you take a mile. All right. Derek, over on your side here. I'm not going to pick on everybody, but I, until I get all my answers, I'm going to pick on people. So just be ready, because I could call on you. Derek, let's... Uh, Self-dependence. Self oh, go ahead. Oh, no, just you only get one. Yeah, because i got to get other people in. Okay. Self-dependence. Depending on yourself. Okay, good. Um, uh, Jewel. Well, maybe you could ask your relatives behind you to give you the answer then. Prideful. That, you can't use using the same word to define pride. Too big for your britches. Man, that's embarrassing when I go out and my pants fall down. I mean, that's really bad. Okay, Ron, how about you? Sure can. Yeah. Frank, you're going to... Uh, you elevate yourself above others. Above you elevate yourself above others. And no matter how candid you feel your expression is, in other words, how truthful you're being, you still might come across as prideful, and that was Ron's point. Okay, John, I'm going to ask you and Carrie. Uh, uh, lack, of lack of humility. The absence of humility. Seems like a hard word defined by the definition of a, uh, another hard word, but I like it. I do like it. All right. So here's some things I want you to think about as we continue that discussion here. It's love for yourself, which I heard. Believing that you can handle things on your own. Again, talking about your own abilities. Better than someone else. Too big for your britches. You are, feel blessed, and you, because you feel blessed, you're kind of like, I'm on God's side, you know, I've got God as my friend. Or, all my stuff and all my accomplishments. To Ron, your, your point, I've done this, all the things. It's a complex word to define. Pride is not something that we like to talk about. But here's what God says about pride. Proverbs 16.5 Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to God. Ooh, that's pretty severe. Abomination to God if you are prideful in your heart. Pride goes before destruction and haughty spirit before a what? A fall. Exactly. Proverbs 21, 24, a proud and haughty man, scoffer is his name. He reacts with arrogant pride. Sound like Nebuchadnezzar? You bet. A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. And then from the New Testament, we have in 1 Peter 5.5 5, and also in James 4.6, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace, grace to the humble. So I want to just ask you, and we could spend weeks on this topic alone, right? Nebuchadnezzar has got pride, and it's standing headlong in his relationship with God in the way. He cannot come to a full realization of who God is because of his pride, of his arrogance, his unwillingness to, to ask for forgiveness of his sins. And Daniel will go right to that here as we read on in Daniel's interpretation and his advice. We can see that he's going to go right to the core of this. And so I don't want us to gloss over the fact that God is speaking to each and every one of us about our pride. I have pride. Yeah, pride is insanity. You know what? I like that. Pride is insanity because it sets you up directly opposed to God because everything that we have, everything that we are able to do is from God. Who are we to take credit for it? It's total insanity. I like that definition. 
So let's continue on here. I do want to get done with this chapter today. I'm going to make it. Okay. Then Daniel, also called Belshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. In other words, go ahead and tell me, even if I'm going to cut you up into pieces and burn your house. Belshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth with beautiful beasts, um, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the beasts of the field, and having t nesting places in its branches for the birds of the air. You, O king, are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky, and your dominion extends to the distant parts of the earth. You, O king, saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leaving the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with dew of heaven. Let him live like wild animals until seven times passes by for him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree the Most High has issued against my lord the king. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until, and here's the key, you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its root means your kingdom will re be restored to you when you acknowledge, get it, when you acknowledge the heaven, that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being full, uh, kind to the oppressed. It may be then that your prosperity will continue. Okay, so how long? Seven years. Until what time? What, what actually transpires here? Until Nebuchadnezzar what? Okay. So he acknowledges that God is sovereign in heaven. So this is why I believe that this is actually a transformation in Nebuchadnezzar's heart. Because God knows how long it's going to take for him to change his mind. And then he actually does change his mind about who God is. And then his sanity restores. So to me, that kind of is a confirmation that this is actually a life-changing event for Nebuchadnezzar. Now, obviously being insane for seven years is a life-changing event, right? Um, but I believe that, that it supports it. Dick, I totally respect your, your, your perspective on it. But when I read this and I look at it, I think that it, it's telling us that it's true that Nebuchadnezzar really has a change of heart here. Otherwise, I don't think God would have brought him back to sanity. And I think there's also another piece here that we have to look at, which is um, when, I, when I read this, I look at Daniel's perspective on it, right? He's, he's afraid of being maybe punished for his information here. But he also goes on and gives some advice to the king. What is his advice? Humble yourself. And what else? Repent. Repent. Be kind to the poor, to the oppressed. He gives them some specific instructions. Do you think that this is going to change in any way, shape, or form, the judgment? How long did it take for it to happen? One year later, and then for seven years. It's kind of interesting. Seven years kind of, and again, I'm going to jump through this pretty fast here, but seven years kind of matches up with our period of the tribulation. Yeah. God knew what was going to happen, but the 12 months was determined by men. Exactly. Exactly. God said it was going to happen, but he didn't say it's going to happen tomorrow. It's going to happen. And I think Nebuchadnezzar probably took it to heart. Daniel's advice. It only took one year to wear off, though. <laughs> and then he said, 
Oh, isn't this a great palace I've got? And I did it all by myself. And you see the pride just flowing out of him. And it's so easy for us. We think we got our pride under control and then something happens and we go, I'm proud. I'm so great. I'm so awesome. I'm not, but I'm just saying that. Okay. You know, uh, in Daniel's faith might have wavered a little bit when he was called to come in uh, uh, do that dream. Or, uh, Interpret it. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think never, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has, he's been getting, how would you say, one shot after the other shot after the other shot of Daniel and his love. You know, so. I think by now he knows enough. I don't think never need to either would ever done anything to Daniel because he might not have. Yeah. He yeah, well, Dan, yeah, he might, Nebuchadnezzar may not have done anything to Daniel because of this. And we can see that he truly, really wanted to know what the answer was. So I want to sc scroll ahead here so we can put a little bit of a bow on this experience. Um, and I'm going to, so 12 months later, it happened just as, I'm, I'm jumping in here on verse 28. And um, I'm going to skip through a few of the verses here just to highlight it. And all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar 12 months later as he was walking in his garden. He said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as a royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? It's all about him, the narcissistic fool. And then a little later on comes down here. The whole experience happens to him just as it was written. Nebuchadnezzar is humbled. God's word proves true the verses in Proverbs the pride pride goes before a fall we could see that point blank here and then Nebuchadnezzar at the end of that time and I'm skipping down to verse 34 at the end of that time I Nebuchadnezzar raised my raised my eyes towards heaven notice it took seven years for him to finally realize seven years and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation, something that He was trying to control. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back His hand or say to Him, What have you done? Nebuchadnezzar just the pagan, the narcissist, he comes to a realization. Is he perfect at this point in time? No, but he comes to the realization who God is. And that's a realization that we all should apply to our lives as we think about um, our relationship with him. We don't have any right to say what kind of a um, treatment we're getting from God to, to second guess God and, and, and the experiences that we have. But we also have the ability to trust him that he's sovereign and in control, regardless of what happens. All right, chapter four in the book, books. Um, we'll be on to chapter five next week. Thank you all for patient, being patient as we work through this. And uh, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you very much for your loving kindness and your goodness. Thank you that we have this opportunity to study the word, that you have a promise for us. It applies and Lord help us to manage our pride to uh, give you the glory to recognize you as sovereign and not to be thinking so highly of ourselves um, that we miss who truly is in control in your name we pray amen